Thanks to everyone again for joining us today. Um, I will start off our presentation that I'm super excited to give you guys today. Um, we worked this summer to make sure every vote counts by improving an art package to detect vote dilution. So we the fellows will be speaking today. It'll be myself, my name's Hikari, um, along with Ari, Wandelin, and Pratik. So we'll go ahead and get started. So to start off, I know I can't see you, but this is uh, just a little exercise to get your mind starting to kind of warm up to this idea of vote, vote dilution. Um, I want you to raise your hand if you vote. I, I actually can't vote, I'm not a citizen. Um, and if you think that voting is important to democracy. So raise your hand again. I guess we have the raise your hand feature. So I guess everyone really does think that to have a working society with a democratic nature to it, voting is a key component to making sure that our society works. So even though we all think this is important, under the hood, we don't necessarily know what happens to our vote once it goes into the system. Um, All right, so do you know if voting inequality still exists in your system? So this could be happening at the local level or the national level, depending if you're voting for a school board official or if you're voting for our president. Or do you know if your vote is actually being diluted or do you even know what that means? So let's break it down from there. So voting systems can actually dilute minor minority voting power. Um, so I want to make this really clear to you all what that actually means. So in our example here, we have a population that's blue and yellow. It's 60% blue and 40% yellow. And as an entire group, they are looking to elect five individuals for five seats. So in this non-diluted case that I'm showing here, we, we have five seats that we are voting for. Um, in our case, in this one, we have wards that are horizontal rectangles. And this ensures that um, we have two yellow wards that could elect two yellow preferred candidates elected. But now let me show you two ways that voting dilution can actually occur. So in the left example, we ex have an example where we have cracking. So this is where the yellow population is spread out among all five wards, and they are unable to elect any seats that their Democratic prefers. So we have five blue seats. And then we have at-large voting, and this is where the entire population votes for every seat. And this in this case, all seats could be candidates preferred by the blue population because they are the majority. So this is actually prohibited by the Voting Rights Act, but it happens more often than you think. An example of a case where voting dilution has occurred is in the case of the East Ramapo School District elections. The makeup of the East Ramapo School Board is a result of an at-large voting system where every registered voter in the district can vote for each candidate running for a seat on the board. The current board consists of majority members that racially identify as white and religiously identify as Hasidic Jews. And this has been the demographic of the board for over a decade. This board has acted to increase funding to the religious and private schools that their children attend, where 98% of the students racially identify as white and have acted against the interests of public school students of the minority population, which consists of Black, Latino, and Asian students. And within the public school system, only 2% of those students are white. So not having equal representation on the school board for over a, the past decade in this case has led to adverse outcomes for minority students, such as low teacher funding or staffing, large class sizes, and ultimately low graduation rates. So in the case of East Ramapo and other cases like it, how do we ensure equal representation? How do we make sure that your vote counts as much as your neighbors? Through using the Jingles test, this test came out of the 1986 Thornburg versus Jingles case, and it's how we prove that voting dilution exists. There are three criteria to be met in order to prove voter dilution. The first being that the minority group is large and geographically compact in order to establish themselves as a majority in a single member district. The second being that the majority voters are politically cohesive or voting for the same preferred candidate. And third, that the majority population votes with the goal of defeating the minority group's candidate. So if we, can, if we can't prove that there is a minority group 
that is both large and compact for criteria one, it will be much harder to assess points two and three. So one of the reasons why points two and three of the Jingles test are hard to prove is that US elections are confidential, like many around the world. As such, we can never really know who voted for which candidate. Take a look at this table. It tabulates all the votes cast in a particular election in the pre election precinct in East Ramapo. At this precinct, just under 10,000 votes were cast in a recent election. We know from looking at our election results that just over 7,000 of those votes went to candidate A, and around 2,500 went to candidate B. And we also know that 8,400 of the voters were white and the rest were minorities. But we don't immediately know how to fill in what goes inside this table. For example, did almost all white voters vote for candidate A or were they split between the two? And with minority voters, it's even harder to tell what's going on. It's possible that all 1,300 of them voted for candidate A or that all 1,300 of them voted for candidate B. Requirements two and three of the Jingles test require the minority voters vote cohesively in favor of one candidate, while the majority cohesively votes in favor of the winning candidate. To see if this is happening, we're gonna to need to fill in this table. Luckily, the field of political science provides us with a tool we can use to get at the preferences of different groups of voters. And this is called ecological inference or EI for short. Ecological inference is a Bayesian statistical technique that takes advantage of the fact that elections take place across multiple precincts. Think about elections you participate in. Maybe in your, at your voting precinct, most people are of one race. But at a different precinct somewhere else in the city, the racial makeup is different. EI looks across all precincts in election for patterns and uses these patterns to estimate the numbers that go into the table. As a simple example in non-statistical terms, if it appears consistently that precincts with more white voters also tend to yield more votes for a certain candidate, we can use ecological inference to conclude that white voters might generally prefer that candidate. So in cases like East Ramapo, we want to run ecological inference. But first, we have to do some work. We need to gather election results and figure out the race of people who showed up to vote. It's easy enough to get election data. To find out who voted, we can go to voter files. So these are data sets maintained by states and counties that contain lists of every voter who has voted in elections in that region. These typically include voters' names and addresses. Most of the time, voter files don't have information about voters' race, which we need to conduct ecological inference, so we have to estimate their race first. We can use BISG to estimate the race of voters. BISG is a well-established tool from the fields of biostatistics and political science for estimating the race of individuals on the basis of their surnames and where they live. But we can't run BISG directly on the voter file, and this is because BISG requires entering voters' locations as latitude-longitude coordinates, like on a map. So to get these coordinates from voters' addresses, we need to do what's ca called geocoding the addresses. Now we see the full pipeline of what it takes to conduct ecological inference. First, we geocode the voter file, then we run BISG to estimate the race of voters, and only then can we run ecological inference. And as any data scientist will know, the pipeline is actually even more complicated than this. In between each of these technical steps, there are a multitude of little steps, including data cleaning, merging, aggregating, researching the best tools, quality control, and so on. EI Compare is a software package written in the R programming language that provides functionality for end-to-end -end ecological inference in the context of elections. EI Compare was initially developed prior to this summer by our project leads, Dr. Matt Barreto and Lauren Collingwood, and this summer, we work to expand its functionality, add additional statistical robustness, and make it more accessible. Now let's see it in action. Using the pipeline of the EI Compare package, we will assess what happened in the East Ramapo School District election. After receiving the voter file, the first step is to ensure that the voter addresses are geocoded. By geocode, we mean find out where voters live using points on a map. Geocoding is a brand new part of the package that didn't exist before. In the past, users would have had to do this step on their own and validate that the geocoded addresses were indeed true. Remember, one of the first criteria of the Jingles test is to prove that the minority group is large and geographically compact. This is typically done by demographers who figure out how the minority groups are clustered. We geocode or convert addresses to la latitude and longitude points that we can put on a map 
of our geographic area of interest. However, in our quest to know if East Ramapo has areas within it that contain minority populations that are geographically large and compact, we, we now need to know the race or ethnicity of each voter. So let's take this voter with the surname Jackson living on Leaf Lane, for instance. How will we find out the race or ethnicity of this voter? So our end goal is to get the racial composition of precincts. And to do so, as Waldon said, we're gonna obtain probabilistic estimates of each voter's race using a method called Bayesian Improved Surname Geocoding developed by Elliot et al. in 2009. Now, EI Compare relies on another package to actually perform the, the BISG called WRU. This was developed by Imai and Kana in 2016. But we've developed helpful utility files to successfully run this uh, package in our pipeline. Now, let's take that voter that Wandelin showed before, the voter with surname Jackson. This surname can be mapped onto a census database of surnames. According to this database, 39% of people last name Jackson are white, while 53% are black. Let's focus on these two racial groups for now only, just for convenience. We can think of this as a prior knowledge of the probability that this person is white or black. However, we also know the address, which we've geocoded, and we can map that geocode onto a geographic unit called a census block. Now, the census also provides demographic information about each of the blocks. And in this case, the census block is 80% black. So this increases the probability that this voter is black. Now, using Bayes' theorem, we can update the prior knowledge provided by the surnames with the additional knowledge provided by the location to come up with the final probabilistic estimate of rates as shown on the right. Importantly, what we're going to do is we're going to aggregate these probabilistic estimates across voters in a precinct to come up with a final racial composition per precinct. That's going to serve as the input to the ecological inference. So now with all of that work done, we can actually run our ecological inference. So as Ari mentioned before, we have this table that we don't know quite what the values are, where the question marks are. So we can actually fill these in now to figure out the proportions for racial group voting for a certain candidate. So once we run EI, we can see that the majority of our white demographic prefer candidate A, around 7,000, and the majority of our minority constituents prefer candidate B. So now that we have all this information, how can we make this more convincing and show not tell? So EI Compare has capabilities to create visuals for us so that we can prove our case to the court. So this is an example of one of those visuals. So this is a density plot. On the x-axis, we have percentage of white voters who voted for a certain candidate. On the y-axis, we have the prob probability or where the peaks are show the most likely value for the percentage of voters that come out of EI. So this graph is for white voters. We can see that candidate A is preferred at around 80% of white voters voted for candidate A. And for candidate B, it's around 19%. Okay, so now that we have this, let's compare it to the density plot of our minority voters. So we can see that the blue and yellow peaks are switched. The yellow is for candidate B, so the minority voters um, prefer candidate B. So this is the end product of EI Compare and is one tool that we can use in litigation and create these visual visuals quickly and easily. So we've proven that each demographic seems to have a strong polar preference for one candidate over the other. And with that, we can cross off the second point for the Gingles test. We can even run EI compare multiple, for multiple years to assess whether the minority group is cohesive throughout those years. And now by proving that across history, we have the basis to start proving point three, where the majority votes in a block to defeat the supported, minority supported candidate. So let's take a look. So we can look at the school board election results throughout the years from 2015 and onwards. So let's take a look. So we have three blue seats for 2015. So the majority preferred candidate won all three seats in 2015. And we can look at 2016, 2017, 2018, you get the point. So minority voters consistently voted for the losing candidate while the majority voters consistently voted for the winning candidate and the minority candidate never won. So this means we can cross off point three for the Gingles test. 
And now we've proven that minority vote dilution existed in these school board elections. This evidence for vote dilution produced by EI Compare was presented earlier in May to a judge in a voting rights case presented by plaintiffs, the NAACP and NYCLU, which is the New York division of the ACLU. Our project leads were actually expert witnesses in this case. The judge sided with the plaintiffs and found that the voting system, which is an at-large voting system in East Ramapo, diluted the minority vote and was unlawful and struck it down. So now what? At-large voting is struck down in East Ramapo. The judge ordered that the system be switched to a ward system containing nine wards, each of which corresponds to one seat on the school board. Both the plaintiff, NYCLU, and the defendant, the school district, had to propose, propose new voting maps for the district. Now, East Ramapo here is shown in the middle in red, and we're given two maps for it. The NYCLU map, the plaintiffs, is shown on the left, and the defendant map for the school district is shown on the right. Each of these two maps look similar, but they have differences in their divisions. Now, Hikari discussed earlier that even a ward system can result in vote dilution if the lines are drawn in the right way. So how do we look at these two maps and tell which, if either, provide adequate representation to minority voters in the school district? Our approach is gonna to be to simulate past elections using these maps. In other words, we'll assess their performance by running them in past elections. We know who voted from the voter file, and we know where they are because we already geocoded them. So we can actually run the election and examine where the minority voters turn out to vote in which wards, and then determine how many seats they would have won if these maps had been in place at that time. And these are the results of our analysis. Now we're showing the same maps as before with each ward color coded by the minority turnout. Now we've outlined the wards in which the minority turnout was sufficient to win a seat on the board. And the NYCLU map on the left, there are three wards in which the minority voters uh, earned enough vote to win, win the seat on the school board. One, two, and three, these are outlined in white. On the other hand, the defendant map has only two seats in which the minority voters would have won seats on the school board. Now, this wards three and four in this map have some elevated turnout, but it's much, much less than the other two. And if we look at Ward three on the left in the NICU map, we can see that this ward, which is high density minority population and turnout, was cracked into three different districts, two, three, and four. And that explains why there's one less seat on the school board for the defendant map. That even though we have a ward system, the vote is still diluted through cracking. This evidence was presented to the judge in the ongoing court case, and she responded favorably to the NICLU map. We hope to hear good news in her decision soon. So this summer, we worked to improve EI Compare. We added many new features to help users move cleanly throughout the process of conducting ecological inference. And this includes the addition of geocoding functions where previous users had to figure this out all, all by themselves. Uh, we also improved the core BISG and ecological inference functions. We sped them up, we added new visualizations, we improved their handling of uncertainty and much more. This is a long list of all the improvements we made to the package and all the ways we applied the package to conduct research throughout the summer. If you would like to learn more about voting rights litigation or would like to see tutorials on how to use the package, check out our website linked here. Or if you're ready to dive into the code, check out the GitHub, GitHub, GitHub repository uh, from which you can download EI Compare and get right started using it. We don't want to stop with East Ramapo. The census is happening right now for which the results of will inform the drawing of new district lines at all levels of government in 2021. We anticipate that EI Compare will be heavily used in a multitude of impending voting rights cases as these new districting lines are tested for vote dilution. In an effort to support this, we spent a lot of time this summer meeting with a variety of stakeholders, including NYCLU, the New York division of the ACLU, who was involved in this East Ramapo case we talked about, the National ACLU, the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, the UCLA Voting Rights Project, and the California Citizens Redistricting Committee. All of these stakeholders have a vested interest in supporting equitable districting. We hope to carry forward these relationships as the fight for voting rights continues. 
want to thank our project leads, uh, Dr. Matt Barreto at UCLA and Dr. Lauren Collingwood at Riverside now at New Mexico uh, for leading us throughout this entire project. It was a wonderful experience. And thank our data scientists, Spencer Wood and Scott Henderson, who provided us countless feedback and technical expertise throughout the entire summer. And also thank our sponsors and want to thank you all for listening.